you want to be uh, off mute. Okay, so we are recording so high. Uh, this is our second Storytellers Happy Hour. Uh, I'm Lisa Kastner, the founder and executive editor of Running Wild Press, and I'm here with my co-host Teehee Hazlett. Um, and Teehee, one of his stories was named, or not his story, actually his uh, book collection was named Best of 2019 by Kirkus last year. Yes. I'm gonna take a minute to introduce some of our fantastic guests today. So I uh, said a little bit about Teehee. He's an author and activist. His debut book, Dark Corners, was named Best Indie of 2019 by Kirkus. And he currently works at Demand Progress, leading campaigns to protect privacy rights in the digital age. Woo! Woo! We have Anna Giles, who's a writer, editor, producer, and actor living in Atlanta, Georgia, by way of Los Angeles. Even though she's a writer, she never knows what to say in these types of things. You know what? None of us do, which is what makes this so fun. <laughs> Tori Eldridge is the author of The Ninja Daughter, nominated for the Anthony, the Lefty, and the McCavity Awards for Best First Novel, and named one of the best mystery books of the year by the South Florida Sun Sentinel. No joke, and you have to read it. I've totally read it. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. The second book in her Lily Wong series, The Ninja's Blade, releases on September 1st. Ooh. Tori has short stories published in several anthologies and a narrative poem in the inaug inaugural reboot of Weird Tales magazine. She holds a fifth degree black belt in Toshindo Ninjutsu. I totally said that wrong. So no, you it was later. perfect. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, and has traveled the US teaching ninja arts and women's self-protection. So if you want to check her out, she's at ToriEldridge.com. Carol Lee Dowd is the author of her own coming of middle age tale. Carol began her career in sports broadcasting and was a public relations and promotions executive and a stringer for the <laughs> Miami Herald in a former life. Following a series of personal plot twists and after her son left for college, Carol went to grad school and earned a master's degree of writing degree in 2012. She has since been published in a variety of platforms, including Running Wild's Anthology of Stories, Volume 2. She's given TED Talks, uh, one specifically entitled, A Perimenopausal Blonde Walks into a University. <laughs> Performed stand-up comedy at the Hard Rock Improv in Fort Lauderdale. She's read from her works in progress as part of Elephant Rock Books, Roar Reading Series at the University of Connecticut, chaired a panel at the Florida Literary Arts Coalition Other Words Conference, and has been part of the Yale Writers Workshop since its inception, which is where we met. And we caused chaos, as it should be. <laughs> um, she's currently finishing her first novel with two others in progress. Born and raised in Queens, New York, she's a uh, mensen, Hates pink, but loves pink. Uh, has never eaten a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and was a tomboy before female athlete became an accepted part of the lexicon. <laughs> and then I am going to ruin Roth's name. Roth Shimonov. Yay! Okay, good. <laughs> Is an independent filmmaker and creative activist in Queens, New York. I'm seeing a theme and you guys will see a theme too shortly in our topics. Uh, having entered the US from JFK, himself a child refugee, his live, video, uh, his live video coverage and personal narrative the JFK protest garnered over 16 million viewers and helped spark the national airport, airport movement against the Muslim ban. His videos have exposed the White House for using doctored videos, helped progressive campaigns promote their messages, and have inspired people across the country into meaningful action. And we welcome everyone. So this excited to have really everyone here. This is impressive group of people. <laughs> Seriously, I feel like I like huge. I know. <laughs> which means I probably should have a, another sip of wine. Yeah. Um, so like, it wasn't here if it wasn't <laughs> So with that, I'm going to hand this off to Tihi, who is going to walk us through how um, the happy hour is going to work. So take it over, Tihi. Yes, so before we started recording, um, story prompts, of which there's like 30 to 40, 
random things that fell out of my head uh, and ended up on cue cards. Everyone got the draw for different prompts. Uh, we've now had a few minutes to think about what sort of impromptu off the cuff story we're gonna tell. All six folks are gonna tell a story. Um, this is like a happy hour space, so we're just hanging out. Hopefully everyone is drinking. Um, I am most recently a Californian, so I'm required to drink White Claw. <laughs> because they don't have carbs. Um, <laughs> so the order we're gonna go in, <laughs> the order, oh yeah, also this is my brother Lesson, uh, who's hanging out and watching. Um, I'm up here visiting him for the weekend. Um, <clears throat> so and the if order we're going to jump in, he's welcome to, by the way. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> what's, it, what's it like to visit someone? I forget. <laughs> I, know, <right? laughs> I can say more. I've, I've like actually flown a lot during the pandemic, but I've also owned a hazmat suit for like going through the airport. So I feel like I'm okay. But anyway. So we have an order of which we're gonna go through. The first up is Tori Eldridge and uh, her prompt is traveling outside of the US. Cool. cool. So I like traveling and um, I write novels that tend to have a lot of you know, cultural things like the Lily Wong series, her mother is uh, from Hong Kong and her father's from North Dakota, right? So I did have an opportunity to go to China and go to Shanghai and Hangzhou and Hong Kong, but that's not the story I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about my, my book research trip to Bali. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was, epic. That was so cool. So I was writing this novel. It was set in Bali. I had done years of research on this. And then I got, you know, sidetracked writing other novels and everything. I finally got the opportunity and the money <laughs> to be able to take this trip to Bali. So uh, I'm dragging my husband with me and literally because he really doesn't like the thought of travel. He always has a good time once he's there, but the whole anticipatory thing and the logistics makes him crazy. So I'm carting him along. And, uh, you know, we, we start off in a, the normal thing where, of course, we're delayed. And so there I am in the split, sitting in the airport, you know, typing, doing a blog, off to a productive start. So we finally get on the dang plane. You fly just hours and hours and hours and the stopover is in Taipei. And uh, wouldn't you know, there was a typhoon. So, you know, we're looking out the window and Woo. the plane that we're supposed to get on is doing this, literally, <laughs> because that's what the wings are made to do so that, you know, it, it doesn't break in half. So, you know, we're looking out and rain's going this way and the, the, the wings are going this way and my husband's going, oh my God. And I'm like, It'll be fine because you know what? I am Miss Positive. I, I, I used to blog on mindful living. I wrote a book on empowerment. I have a freaking ninja protagonist. I'm a fifth degree black belt. I am all about, you know, take it on. And my husband's like, I'm going to kill you. So, <laughs> so they tell us we're not going anywhere. So we're going to get on a bus and we're gonna put you up in a hotel. So we walk out of the hotel, <laughs> you know, in the rain and the wind to the bus, clawing our way, getting on this thing. And, and we're going through it and I'm like, isn't this great? We get to see Taiwan. And my husband's like, <laughs> so then we get into this itty bitty, itty bitty little hotel room and we get all these little things and we go down to the buffet, and, the buffet. And, and it's all this food he doesn't wanna eat. You know, and, and I'm like, oh, look at this, and oh, look at that, and oh, you know, some kind of fermented bean tea. How creative, <laughs> you know, and what's this thing with squid? And he's just <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm gonna kill you. So it's all good, right? I'm like, don't worry about it. Next morning, we get on the plane. It's straight, except that we're going to Jakarta. We're not going to Bali. Now, in case you don't know, it's a different <laughs> island. <laughs> you can't swim from one to the other. You can't hop a ferry. There's Jakarta and there's Bali. And by the way, they have very different energy 
And I spent years researching the history of Indonesia. And this particular novel that I was writing had a whole past life theme and intertwine that had to do with the 1965 and 66 Indonesian massacres. Great. So I'm like, <laughs> no, the problem. Book research. It'll be fabulous. So we get to Jakarta and they say, oh, sorry. There's a nine hour delay. We can't wow. get you to Bali for nine hours in the Jakarta airport. Well, guess what there's to eat in the Jakarta airport? Squid. Nothing my husband wants. <laughs> I'm like, oh, new foods to try. And he's like, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> so, meanwhile, I find out that smart people, smart people are paying extra to buy tickets unrelated to this disaster of a trip to just get to Bali in the next hour or two. Do I do that? No, because <laughs> I'm not a smart person. So <laughs> nine hours later, I get it. We get on the plane. We land in Bali. It's the middle of the freaking night. It's like midnight there, right? So there's supposed to be all these bluebird taxis and everything. And it's supposed to be all, you know, just great, you know, orderly, because I've done my research, by the way. I have this all mapped up. I know what we're doing. I've got this huge epic trip pound, you know, in, in Seminyak and Ubud and, uh, you know, uh, Sidamon. And, I, and I'm going to make my husband climb up the base of Holy Mount Ogun in the middle of the night, because that's <laughs> what my character did. And so we're going to go up there with headlamps and up the trail, you know, my husband's 14 years older than me. He's like, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> but, but that's yet to come. But I've got this all planned out. And it's gonna be fabulous. So, but right now we land in Bali. We land in Bali immediately. I get the whole vibe. Oh, it's so wonderful. You, you can even tell at night, in the middle of the night, Bali airport's deserted. You can still feel the whole vibe, right? I'm like, yay. So we get out and immediately we are descended by all of this. I want to ride? You want to ride? You want to ride? And I'm like, no, 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 because I've read about this. This is not good. I need a bluebird taxi. I need a, you know. So we're, we're walking across and we're trying to find this. And of course, I can't find a bluebird taxi. And I find, I find somebody who kind of looks, uh, you know, he's, he's looking at me like, do you need help? And he, he's speaking English and he's clearly a tourist. And well, no, he's not a tourist. He's an expat and he seems to be from, from America. And I'm going, oh, please God, let this be okay because there are no taxis and I don't know who these people are swarming on me. And my husband's like, I'm gonna kill you. And so, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, it'll be fine. So God bless him. He, he's gonna drive us. But you know, first he's gotta make a stop. And I'm like, oh God, all right. I don't have my ninja knife, but I'm thinking to myself, I can handle this. We're going to stop. It better be a good stop. So it's fine. He's picking up his wife. Hey, that's not a problem. So he takes us to this place and, and we get there and it's all good. And it's so wonderful. And we get in there and it's like, you know, just like this dream come true, you know, no air conditioning, but do I care? I'm from Hawaii. I don't mind the heat. My husband <laughs> pouring sweat. I'm going to kill you. You know? <laughs> It's like, it'll be fabulous. It'll be wonderful. It's just going to be terrific, you know. And we're out there, you know, and we're walking on the little, you know, the little bitty streets and, you know, the cars are like brushing up past you because everything's like that. And, you know, you see uh, uh, cows with horns just like in a pasture next to, you know, a convenience store for like no apparent reason. And you're like, okay, that's fine. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was awesome. It sounds fabulous. So, um, so you lived. <laughs> like my first your husband hasn't I, killed you I, yet. <laughs> and you're, you're still married, right? Yeah. You, you just still celebrated married. your 32nd anniversary. <laughs> so That's this true. was bonding. <laughs> we had such a good time. <laughs> he had such a good time. I care. I kid you not. And he was so proud of himself for going up that mountain in the middle of the night. I mean, literally, <laughs> we left on the hike at 11 at night. That's when they came and picked us up. You know, wow. we're like hiking up and, and we get up to, you know, a certain point and then we stop for the sunrise and then we came back and then I dressed him up 
because we were going into the temples and I wanted to get to the inside of the temples and to do that, you have to be dressed appropriately. So I bought him, you know, the, the whole sarong, oh. the hat, and I've forgotten all the names for everything and a little sash and dressed him up real good. Yeah, it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was, it was That's so awesome. funny. It was great. <laughs> what a great story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like, like one thing that I can like totally see my head is like the the cab drivers descending on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm I'm about to move to Puerto Vallarta, and one of the things that I love about going to the beach in Puerto Vallarta is getting descended on by people selling you things. <laughs> but like they sell they sell you like oysters, they'll sell you a sombrero or a bracelet or cocaine or ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> one after another they're just like Coca cola but you're not <laughs> getting in a car with them right at midnight right oh my god it must be amazing to sell something and the items you use to smuggle it yeah. <laughs> <Everything> <laughs> is for it's a bundle it's a bundle it is. Oh. a special bundle <laughs> Well, Why does that bracelet cost seventy two dollars? <laughs> <laughs> you have an accessory. <laughs> That's awesome. Good. Oh man. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah how much all of that, I'm not sure how much cocaine is in Bali. I guess that's an inappropriate <laughs> <laughs> You know, I didn't ask, and that wasn't in my <laughs> research. I was gonna say, <laughs> that wasn't on the list. <laughs> it wasn't on the list. It wasn't on the I list. I feel like but, I'm traveling yeah. Puerto Vallarta yeah. so much now, even during the pandemic, they're still selling you cocaine all, I, the, I, yeah. all the time. I, I think if, if Frommers was written in LA, it might have that portion. <laughs> all right that sounds appropriate yes oh my god all right so we have our next storyteller uh carol and i gotta follow that <laughs> yes <laughs> you have to follow bali and you have to follow a bunch of mexican cocaine with <laughs> the story of my life um, <laughs> Bali and Mexican cocaine. I was gonna say that's wait, wait, can we do that story? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, uh, well, I, I grew up in Queens. I just, um, it seems like everybody has. Um, but <laughs> I was, uh, I was one of one of four kids. There were three, three girls. I have two sisters and a brother. And my father was a was NYPD. And that was fun. And um, we, his, uh, we used to, every summer, we would uh, go on road trips because, you know, my father wasn't on the take. So, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And uh, this was in the 70s, the whole Serpico thing and everything. So um, he, once he, he finally, he saved up and we got our first new car. And when I say new car, it was a... Kelly Green Dodge Sportsman van. Ew. And I mean, ew. No, right? <laughs> wait, wait. But there's more. It was, it wasn't one of those, there were two captain's chairs and they were in the front, of course, you know, and um, then there were two bench seats in the back. And when I say it was like, we bounced around in there like, you know, like a, uh, ball bearings in a tin can because <laughs> at, at that point in time um seat belts were a suggestion you know yes. that, you know, you know Usually they were like stuck down in the back with the dog hair and the popcorn and whatever got you know stuck in the van and um it was a metal a rolling metal tube basically but my father was very creative and he finished the inside of the van with uh, wood paneling. Oh, and, um, 70s. <laughs> with, 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 uh, yeah, I, we were baby, basically the Brady Bunch on wheels, you know? In a reverse Woody. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. That if he had, if he had thought about, thought to put 
the wood on the ceiling, it would have been like a rolling sieve because oh he, he put everything on with screws. Um, but you know, it was kind of, it, it was cool. It was, you know, the for our first new car, no air conditioning. Um, Why would you the, that? Right? The front two uh, windows, uh, you know, mom and dad seat rolled down because it was like 1972, I think, or 73. The other windows pushed out. Like they, they, like you lifted it up and it pushed out. So you had this little isosceles triangle of <laughs> air coming in that we would like, you know, stick our faces out when, you know. And um, one day he came to pick me up at school I was 12, so, you know, I was in that very awkward stage of being 12, and, um, <laughs> you know, he comes pulling up to the front of the school, and um, he had accessorized the van by putting our name on the side with those little slanty gold and black things that you stick on your mailbox. Oh yeah. So he pulls up and our name is like I, I couldn't cover. I couldn't I couldn't even say I know who that I don't know that is. My freaking name is on the side <laughs> of the damn van, you know. So you know, you're 12, everything your father's out to get you on purpose, you know, to embarrass <laughs> you and you know. So one of the one of the trips that we took, I mean, it was the engine was basically between the front two seats and it was hot so it was basically this promontory of you know gas powered combustion engine in between our my parents who both smoked at the time <laughs> so we're in the back with no matter where we went we're in the back on these vinyl seats you know like you know you know every time you move <laughs> a little petri dish underneath your thighs um and um I mean, one year we went to, um, so everywhere we went, we went up and down the East Coast. We went out to South Dakota in August with no air conditioning. Ooh, four kids in a, in a van with pop-out windows and two parents who smoked with an AM radio. <laughs> All right. Woo. Fun times. I like AM okay. radio. <laughs> <laughs> no. So... The, but the, the, the trip that I remember the most is we went up to uh, Canada. We went up to Maine. We were going to Canada. My father had these, I mean, he wanted to be, he was like the original urban cowboy. You know, I mean, he wore jeans and a cowboy hat and the, to, be, to, be, to work so that he would, then he would change into his uniform in, in Flushing, in Flushing Girl Park, you know. <laughs> he was one of the original TPU, you know, precursor of SWAT. So um, one summer we went up to, we, we drove up to Maine with a buddy of his and his family. And uh, we were taking the ferry called the Blue Nose across the Bay of Fundy from Maine to Nova Scotia. All right. So, you know, my mom dresses us all, you know, my, my sister and I have our pull on brown polyester bell bottoms with the elastic <laughs> waist and matching shirts, you know, my little sister, just to tell the difference between us, you know, hers is green, hers are brown. <laughs> and, you know, I don't remember what my brother wore because he was a boy, so, it, you know, <laughs> he could tell, they could tell the difference between the, you know, four kids in five years, you got to figure out who's who. For, for <laughs> half my life, I thought my name was Linair above Carol. <laughs> uh, so so we're getting ready so we get on the you know you drive the van the van on the blue nose we're pulling a pop-up camper one of the coleman campers so we get onto the and we go up and we didn't have a we were going to stay on on the deck the whole time well my my dad's buddy had a uh had a cabin for the day so you know we're getting ready we're up there and we go we all sit and we actually got to eat in the restaurant which we never got to do. So we had breakfast. So I have, you know, I never got to, I had eggs and, and, um, and I didn't want more, I didn't like orange juice. So they had to make, you know, V8, tomato juice. Oh, great. You know, I had egg, I like tomato juice, you know, I'm, I'm sitting pretty. So we go out, it's an, it's a seven hour trip across mm. the Bay of Fundy. Um, it got rough. Uh -oh. We are on the deck the entire time, 
And uh, all of a sudden, I'm not feeling so good. None of us are. I think like three quarters of the of the boat are sick at this point. So we're there, and I know I'm gonna throw up. Well, my mother hands me a barf bag. I had never used one before. She forgot to open it up. <laughs> so I threw up on top of the barf bag. <laughs> Spent the rest of the trip hanging over, you know, I was trying, I wanted to sleep. And every time I would sit down to sleep somewhere, I was like 11 or 12 at the time. I would sit there, there somebody would move along, move along. I'm like, move along, where? Where the hell am I supposed to go? We're on a freaking boat, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, of course, the fried eggs and tomato juice at that point didn't seem like such a good idea. Um, uh, because it tasted a lot better going down than it, than it did coming up. And um, we wound up, I mean, we, we made it through, obviously, and we were the last ones off the ship because my father, we were pulling a camper. And as we're driving along, the first thing my father wants to do is, I think it was Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, oh, you know, God. just what you need. <laughs> After that, we went to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and, and that night we spent, we spent the, that night in a uh, campground next to a cemetery and the last I remember my parents and the other parents walking through a cemetery with Tupperware glasses full of highballs going, we're not doing that shit yet. <laughs> <laughs> nope. And that, that was it. That happened. <laughs> so good. You know, that green van is still in Queens, right, Carol? No, <laughs> you know what? It, Honestly, it plays, I, uh, it plays I, bootleg I, jingles and sells I, I, it for sells $75. Yeah. Sells so good. <laughs> Snow cones and cocaine. Um, yeah. no. Daddy, why are these ice cream cones <laughs> hollow? <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> actually, I actually wrote a, um, I wrote an essay called All is Vanity, and I read it at, at Yale one year. And um, it was um, the end, how it ended up. What, it actually, it went on all of our trips, and it wound up rusting in this loamy outcropping outside the house my parents built in Connecticut until one day, and it still had the little nameplates on the side when they eventually, I was in college by then, and eventually it just, I think they went to move it, it just went <laughs> 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 I think it's actually part of the driveway. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but okay. you know what was left? That fucking nameplate. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like it's better that a van, a marked van pulls up with your name on it than an unmarked van yeah. pulls up. Right? Well, this is, well, uh, uh, like, as long as you know, as long as you know the driver, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot about me. It's weird. We had windows, though, and they weren't blacked out. <laughs> I was so proud of my mom vans. <laughs> when I had my little boy, had I had a maroon van, van and then I had a white van. And nope. Never had a minivan. Mm -mm, nope. Well, you never had kids, Lisa, so you never <laughs> had cause to have a minivan. I have one. Cats. cats don't need a minivan. <laughs> I, like, the I was going to say. The motion sickness thing and the throwing up is so interesting because, like, the one time that happened to me on a ferry is like, that moment that you know you're gonna throw up. Oh man. But when the worst. you actually throw up is like so small. <laughs> you're like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like oh having my god, been it's happening right now. <laughs> having been pregnant, oi. <laughs> you get really you get really good at it. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 throwing up for two. <laughs> right. But you know the thing about being pregnant is you're hungry. When you get hungry, oh my God, it's like you better feed me in the next 30 seconds or I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> Are you sure your husband's still around? I don't see him anywhere. <laughs> Only one person's making it out of this marriage. <laughs> That's me, I baby. Two, with, two people enter, one person leaves. Someone can kill someone, and the other one is a black belt. <laughs> it doesn't stand a chance. Doesn't stand a chance. Our last house, we had. I had all my spears right in the front door. Like you walk in, and there's like all of these spears leaning up against the corner. That's awesome. <laughs> You're like, this isn't a warning. Like when your son's bringing like their new girlfriend, 
Right. Why? <laughs> it was my spears. Just in case. It's just the collection. Don't worry. I don't know how to use them. Okay, come on in. Oh, wait, I lied. I'm a black belt. <laughs> my, my boys used to th use me to threaten people. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. I'll stick my mother on you. <laughs> yeah. My 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 late husband my late husband used to say used to say when my when my son would come over and uh, you know he'd say he'd say they'd say something about you know being af being afraid to introduce her to you know Brenda be like well I'm afraid to introduce you know you know with with David and I'm like and he, David's like David was like yeah I'm not the one you got to worry about you got to worry about your mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. There's accuracy in that I know you. There's accuracy. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Books and covers, baby. Books and covers. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. People, it, it's fun when people underestimate me because they do it once. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love being underestimated. Like, oh snap! I'm about to come through with like everything that you don't expect. Uh, right? Huh? I've seen it happen. I got it happen. stories. <laughs> coming for everyone's edges um all right so this next story this is a rough transition sorry uh but i'm really <laughs> excited about this prompt <laughs> i wrote it because I, I i was like oh my god there's so many things that could happen with this prompt. Uh -oh. um but this is anna's prompt anna anna's prompt anna giles which is this story could only happen in florida <laughs> i love this where i live <laughs> big setup and I don't I feel like my story is more of a statement but I'm gonna try and like start a little further back so it's more of a story because you because um Carol and Tori told such good stories and I'm like ugh, mine's like not even like no pressure it's no pressure I I stop apologizing Anna yeah um, exactly <laughs> Uh, so I, um, I'm going to start a little further back. Like I said, I got unexpectedly knocked up in Ooh. 2015 by my husband. It's not like, again, <laughs> not a wild. I'm like, thing. what does unexpectedly knocked up mean? You woke up and I'll you're like, oh gonna, my God. I'm thinking she's going to tell a story about an unmarked van. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh God. That would be so, that would be so but yeah, it's a, it's a virgin birth, no. Uh, but I, um, my husband and I got married, and he had uh, cancer a, a while ago, but we didn't know if we could ever have kids, so we wanted them eventually. So come to find out a month after we got married, I was pregnant, but I didn't know about it for like the first three months. And so wow. I was living in Los Angeles, living my dream as a poor, starving actor. And, um, but like doing kind of well, like I'd been there about a year at that point. Um, and my husband and I are both originally from Georgia, met on the West Coast. And we were like, well, fuck, we can't afford a baby in LA. So we need to move back to Georgia where um, his parents live and we're going to move him with them, which is what we did for like the first year of my daughter's life. And obviously I decided to have her. Um, so we had $600 on our bank account, moved back to Georgia. I was working remotely. I hadn't really started my own writing business yet. I have like a super sparse bio too. Cause I was like, for some reason I thought it was going to go in the zoom box. Like, <laughs> why am I, I don't know why I fucking thought that. Cause I'm on zoom all the time uh, for work, but that's what I thought. And so I like didn't write anything. I have my own like little copywriting business now. Um, back then I didn't, I was just kind of freelancing and working from home best I could. I was actually working for, um, that was awful <laughs> whilst I was pregnant, but you know, whatever. And then my husband, um, we both were trying to work in entertainment. He got a job working um, in extras casting on a TV show called Devious Maids once we moved back to Georgia. Oh, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Yeah. Lifetime. <laughs> yeah. I partied with the cast um, at the closing of like their last season and they were wonderful. No, <laughs> no cocaine in Bali. Um, <laughs> but they were they were very cute um uh so anyway he was like oh, on this tv show and that also wasn't a great job and we were living in my in-laws and my son's or my son my husband's childhood bedroom my in-laws house 
It was like Jurassic Park wallpaper. And uh, I'm a super, <laughs> amb- yeah, like lining the walls. And I'm a super ambitious person. And so like leaving Los Angeles, which was my dream city to live in for the longest time to come back to Georgia made me feel like just the ultimate failure. Um, so it just felt really shitty and it sucked. And I was like still auditioning when I was pregnant and not getting parts. And probably cause like, I look so young, <laughs> but, or I did. Um, and the motherhood sucked the life out of me now. But um, yeah, and I just, I, I felt like the ultimate failure. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, I, I had my child, which is wonderful. Best thing that ever happened to me. Fucking great kid. Um, I was always like, I'm going to have a baby and I'm going to keep acting and I'm going to still be a superstar. <laughs> um, didn't realize like how much your priorities change with parenthood, obviously. Uh, but I really wanted to keep pushing forward because I also wanted to see my kid or have my kid see her mother as a, as a mother that went after what she wanted. Um, so I started auditioning as soon as I could um, after I had her, which was about four or five after I had her. I went back to work like writing the week after I had her because I was bored. <laughs> so... Um, I auditioned uh, for something through a self-submission process uh, on a casting board. And um, I I kept uh, coming in for callbacks. Like I did a video callback and it was kind of weird, but I was like, you know, Atlanta's not the same as LA. So maybe like, this is just what they do here. And I like <laughs> met a guy at like a, a Ramada conference room um, for a callback, but his like wife and son were there. It was, it was fine. Like it was in it was public. Like it was, you know, that's not normal. I just want to reinforce that, that that is not not normal. I mean, I did it in LA too. It was like, I mean, it's, and yeah, no, I hear you and I agree with you. And (laughs) you you should like spring for like a a real casting studio or something. But, um, that's usually preferred. Yeah. Preferred. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, this is fine. Like, I'm still in my late 20s, so I think I'm the shit, and like, uh, nothing can harm me. Um, so, uh, living in my bubble. Um, but he was really nice. It was fine. Um, and the movie, which I don't think it's even out yet, and I like the. I ended up like kind of having a falling out with the producers and stuff over like pay issues, but I don't. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be public. <laughs> I'll save some things for for privacy that involve other people. But anyway, the movie's called <laughs> The Kama Sutra Garden. It is a Bollywood movie that was filmed mm-hmm. in Florida. So in January 2016, I drove like the eight hours down to Florida to film a Bollywood movie, which the producers of the movie insisted it was not a Bollywood movie. However, we had to learn a Bollywood dance. <laughs> and it was, it was about like a bunch of women in a brothel and I was one of the women um and of course like after having a baby I was like yeah I can still be in a brothel <laughs> uh, um, but so with me and um I, about almost 10 other girls and we were all like staying in they had like rented out mansions for us to stay in again not the best idea probably on my part I actually um some emails between my mother-in-law and my my mother talking about what a bad idea it was because they accidentally <laughs> forwarded it to me um and I read Accident- about they accidentally forwarded Acc- it to her <laughs> <laughs> accidentally and it was all about like how like they hope i calm down one day and become a real mom which i guess means don't <laughs> go to wow Ouch. um Woo. yeah it was yeah it was kind of hurtful years ago water under the bridge now obviously because i'm still bringing it up but um, <laughs> but it's fine it's fine it's fine okay, it's I'm, okay. over it. I'm much better now <laughs> I'm much better i'm fully over it i have therapy it's fine um <laughs> this uh, but, <laughs> uh but yeah so um it was like you know you walk in there's like six other girls you don't know there and you, not like I spent a lot of time in Hollywood because I didn't. I was mostly like an indie film actor. Um, never really made it. So, uh, but it's just like the entertainment world 
kind of shitty a lot of the time, especially to women and pitting them against each other. Um, even like to this day, and I'm 33 now, which is not at, not old by any means, no, but I am not. older. <laughs> no, but I'm older than in my 20s, and like you know, it's um, and I'm still working, so it's really nice. And but it's still like you, they pit women against each other, and it sucks. Um, but myself and all the other girls became like best friends during a two week period of shooting this Bollywood movie that was not a Bollywood movie in Florida. Um, <laughs> like hanging out on the beach, getting um, food together. And like, I don't, I don't think the, like the crew of obviously mostly men, um, how it is. And again, in the entertainment industry uh, expected that. And we were all like really tight knit and we still like have a giant text chain to this day and love each other and support each other. Um, and like in between takes, awesome. I was like, yeah. yeah, I was like pumping um, my milk and stuff. Uh, for my child so I could like store it in a cooler and then bring it home because I wasn't going to waste my milk um, while I was awake she was still like six months old then uh, and I was breastfeeding obviously and um, they were all really supportive like they would they would be like Anna's pumping right now like leave her alone she'll shoot her scenes <laughs> later and we would all like stand up for each other because of course like I said there was shitty behavior too sometimes not naming names so hopefully I won't get sued <laughs> <laughs> who cares uh, the world's ending, but yeah, so that was, um, that's my, it's not very Florida specific, but that's, like, I shot a Bollywood movie in Florida, and I learned a dance, um, that they ended up, like, cutting me from the dance, so I just kind of, like, know this dance, um, let's see some of the moves, show, yeah, show yeah. us some of the moves, <laughs> wow. Bollywood movie, like, my husband learned this, I would, like, send him a video, your husband doing. learned <laughs> Yeah, awesome. you like even better than I do. I think do. we should all do this. Okay. I love so, it. All right, yeah, come on, guys. Here we I, are. I, I, mine look, mine, mine looks <laughs> like, like Rio de Janeiro, you know? Like, <laughs> totally, yeah. This is very Bobby. Rio. I feel yeah, like only good. you and these other women can say that they filmed a Bollywood movie in Florida, though. Right? Like, I think really... that's amazing. Where are you Florida? Where did you go? Where was uh, it? It was Clearwater and... Oh, on the West Coast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was a long trip. Um, and then I think it was just outside of Orlando. It was like two different man like they were mansions. Like the second yeah. one we filmed that had these giant dogs there too, like those kind of horse like dogs. Yeah. Um, okay. Had, like, Over it, uh, not uh Great Danes. They weren't maybe they were Great Danes. Actually they probably were. But yeah, yeah about that size anyway. They were like they were like horses basically. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah. Their water is also down there. If I had to guess where they would film a not Bollywood Bollywood movie in Florida, <laughs> like I do feel like Clearwater would be. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. That's, that's like where the uh, <laughs> where the the Ringling Estate is, and yep. uh, like Clearwater, Sarasota, um, the new uh, new college, and everything is over oh, there. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of big homes. I feel like even the Florida story was a Queen story since we all moved there. <laughs> like the theme is... <laughs> I love all, all the stuff you were saying about the, you know, the, the Hollywood story and, you know, talking about women in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, when I, I was, uh, when I left uh, Cats in the East Coast to come out to LA, I was breaking into uh, television and, and I was auditioning for The Love Boat and it was for, you know, the, the Love Boat Mermaids. And so we went through a whole afternoon of, you know, dancing and, and all this stuff, right? And then we had to do the, all this, these things and we got cut and cut and cut and cut into a smaller group, you know, because- yeah, because there, there was only a six foot by six foot, you know, platform you danced on and that. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, they're only looking for eight women and they went to eight cities to find eight women, you know, so it was like, you know, 8,000 women. So anyway, by the, by the, after the afternoon of cutting, they said, and, and you'll appreciate this, Anna, they're like, okay, the, the, the choreographer said, all right, now go and fix yourselves up. And so this was in the Bonaventure Hotel. So we go into the Bonaventure Hotel. The lounge is enormous, right? Huge banks of mirrors. And all these women, Hollywood dancers, right? They pull out out of these huge dance bags, hair dryers, makeup <laughs> kits, curlers, a change of clothes, all this stuff. And I'm sitting there and, and I'm standing next to the gal who was flown in from New York, who ended up being my best friend. And she did Broadway musicals too. So we were from the same background. And I looked at her and I went, 
I got a brush. And she goes, <laughs> I got a lipstick. And we went, cool. <laughs> and everybody else is like, and, and then, you know, you, get, you line up. And at the very end, I kid you not, Aaron Spelling does this in front of my face. Oh. Yeah, yeah, like this. And I'm like, this is happening. This is a Hollywood <laughs> moment. It's yeah. a practice for a Zoom meeting. <laughs> it was really weird. It was, it was a very weird thing. But yeah, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Wow. I yeah, you know, I felt I felt fancy because I actually used product in my hair tonight, you know, <laughs> for the first time in God knows how long, but I didn't wear shoes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No shoes. No, no. shoes. No yeah. shoes. So Tori, you were you were in cats? I was. Yeah. I was in the okay, this is how old I am. <laughs> I was in the original first national company oh in eighty three. So what Anna, I could be your mother. Like Me easy. Well, Tori, <laughs> my eldest son is third one. There, there I can be all your mother, except for Tori. <laughs> there were two I things. Be mine. Fine with me, please. Okay. There were two things. There were two things that threw me into my coming of age as a young man. It was the Fly Girls and In Living Color, and my parents taking me to see Cats live, where I was just like so confused of why I was attracted to cats and what was happening, because <laughs> because they were just like everywhere, and like like looking into my eyes, and like, it was really they're like wearing the skin tight everything. Oh my God, that was my favorite part of the show. Was the very beginning during the overture because we got to crawl into the audience yeah, and I was yeah, like totally was in. I was totally into the acting of the cat right so I would crawl across and can you imagine you're sitting there in the orchestra all dressed up and this cat woman right is crawling across the arm rests in like you know five six seven people into the row crawling like in that was use her ass you know and, 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 and i'm like you know you know doing this thing and looking at their face and i think i'm so cool and i'm thinking about this later going what was that like to be sitting there you know oh did you, did you, did you, did you see uh you rough and and did you see the cats movie i couldn't i i didn't watch it no, look at her, no. <laughs> No. Yeah, I heard it was not um, awful. I heard it was awful. Yeah. Like I didn't even know. Little, little creepy. Little creepy. Yeah. I would <laughs> okay. really get kids. some shrooms and possibly some Mexican Coca Cola before. I'm <laughs> 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 not more banned. <laughs> that sounds oh so God. fun. Really. <laughs> so I'm thinking a Bali movie in Florida sounds pretty good. Sure. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm totally Sounds like an Airbnb experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I think we all need to like do this at least once a month because, you know, I'm, feel, I'm feeling you people. <laughs> I also think there should be some sort of blog where people go through Florida Airbnb experiences <laughs> and just report on what they have to offer. Because oh, I yeah. swear, Bollywood movie. <laughs> That's not an actual Bollywood movie there you go. for tax purposes. It's probably <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anna, are you where are you now? I'm in Atlanta, but um my hope is that I'm gonna move back to the West Coast. Oh uh, eventually, maybe in the next year, which I haven't oh, really cool. told oh, any of my jobs about. But hey, I'm drinking Diet Coke with liquor in it, so why not? <laughs> you guys, as you should. Are, are you in Atlanta proper Safe or beer. are you in, <laughs> yeah. in the city? Yeah, I'm in the city proper. Uh, and yes, it is a shit show here. Oh. Uh, it, it's it's very frustrating. Um, like I said, I'm originally from the South, but I'm from like, uh, uh, Tee and I went to college together. And my dad's a professor at that college. So I grew up in that town and was a townie. And it's just like the most redneck town ever. But honestly, like, yeah. Tee, I don't know if you, I don't know if you follow the Statesboro Herald, but um, it's called Statesboro, Georgia. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's like near Savannah. Um, yeah. They've been actually, parts, I've seen like some things coming through where they're doing some things right in this 2020 hellscape, um, mm -hmm. more so than Atlanta even, but it's, yeah. it's frustrating because it's just like, you know, our governor's attacking our mayor who's trying really to do the right yeah. thing mostly. Um, and it's, it, people are, 
really just to follow the um, w- whatever political leader is saying to not wear masks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although he yeah. just appeared with masks. <clears throat> right. Yeah. 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 So, like there, it's just it's kind of this weird surreal nightmare yeah and yeah. it's very frustrating yeah it's just like that anywhere in america Kemp was not really legitimately elected one but two or b i should say because i'm tipsy i really appreciate <laughs> how civil and polite you were of describing statesboro as near savannah and not like this crazy <laughs> Nightmare hellscape of trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Bum fuck middle of nowhere. No, it's like it's I love Statesboro because I grew up there and I was a townie and I think it gives me character in a sense. <laughs> because I grew up in this like crappy small town, but it's you know, I also grew up thinking um it, not really with a narcissistic view, but kind of where it was like, oh my story's unique. <laughs> but you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> so many of us grew up in small towns that that were very conservative or whatever, and we all have different unique aspects of that same story. Absolutely. In some ways, uh, Queens. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there there are pockets of Queens that are very like you know insular. So oh, um, all blocks. It's block by block. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, most yeah. cities Seriously. are like that. It's block yeah. by block. It's, mm-hmm. block, it's block by block. Yeah. The scariest place I feel like I've ever lived, if we don't count Florida, which we're not for the sake of this experience, um, <laughs> having lived in Atlanta, having lived in New York City, having lived in LA, having um, now moving to Mexico, which, you know, moving into a city that's run by one drug cartel, which makes it safer. The scariest place I've ever lived is States. <laughs> 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 wow. That's true. If you guys get the chance, yeah. Google Statesboro Herald sound off. And it's it's basically Statesboro's local residents writing to the local newspaper about things like, well, someone stole a fridge off my porch. And I sure, <laughs> wish, I sure wish Bobby, my cousin, who I know stole the fridge off my porch, wow. would bring it back. It's oh like literally God. that. It's like, no, I've, I've driven, I've driven through that. I mean, you know, coming down 95 and shooting across my, my, um, my brother-in-law and his wife live in, uh, Canton, Georgia. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, outside of Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Outside of Atlanta. Yeah, and I've been to Alpharetta and Roswell and yeah. So I've driven through Atlanta, um, several times and mm. it t- takes like a day to get through Atlanta. <laughs> Yeah, it does. Traffic. Yeah, Atlanta's fine. I I'm a part of a theater company here that I really um, love and care about. That oh, are great. great. Um, yeah, but it's it's also like I love the West Coast. I don't. I, I grew up in Georgia. I don't. I I left for a reason for several years, <laughs> and it's just it's very frustrating a lot of the time too to yeah. be back here. Like I said, it's. Yeah. Well, I told Lisa, I said, when, if I ever, if, if I can ever get to the, to California, um, after all this, <laughs> if, if I'd love to come to visit, I, mean, I, totally. I mean, I literally live on the beach in St. Augustine. I just, that's why I don't wear shoes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I thought I California's I Florida was a last store. I have to admit, I do, you know. <laughs> but, um, Yeah. And, and this pandemic has been like, you know, because I live alone. My, hus- my husband passed away uh, uh, last year. And um, so that was just before the pandemic. So it was like going into it kind of like that. They kind of dovetailed each other. So um, who the hell knows what normal is anymore, you know? <laughs> right? I have no idea. It's no crazy. idea. But Ross still has to tell his story. I know, and yeah. I forgot, Thank you. I mean, you know. <laughs> Thank you for doing the transition for me. <laughs> I, used to, I, was a co- I was a coach and a trainer. It's like, okay, everybody stay on track. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Sorry. <laughs> I actually, I will, I will hook up with you later to talk more about coaching stuff. Um, <laughs> But yes, up next we have Raphael, and Raphael has this prompt, which is airports and plane rides. And I apologize for my terrible handwriting because at some point I had started drinking when I started writing. 
it is pretty amazing that uh, Trump is wearing a mask. I think I think they found out in Queens. We think that he's only wearing a mask because someone painted Putin's asshole into it on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> but I think. Wow. Um, so yeah, I think it's really air drum. <laughs> I think like it's really fun that I got the airport one because I was introduced with about an airport story. So I'm really lucky. Um, and mine starts with the Muslim ban, like, and, and thankfully that was just defeated um, again. Um, and so was the Africa ban. And the day of the Muslim ban, I was just riding to work, which I, I used to work in Brooklyn with Tihi and, um, and I kept getting these calls from people saying, Raphael, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to Brooklyn. They're like, everything's happening in Queens. Why are you going to Brooklyn? I'm like, what's happening in Queens? And they're like, we're all getting together at the airport because of the Muslim ban. And I was like, okay. So then I had this like weird thing because I didn't have any of my professional equipment. Like, and I'm like so attached to it. Uh, it's like my second arm, but I didn't want to miss a thing. So I was just like, I, I have my cell phone and I'm just going to go. I don't need all that. Right. And and I, don't, I was like, this is a mistake. I really do need all that. But I just went and went <laughs> to the airport and, um, and, and I realized my phone is dying and I realized people are starting to really assemble. And it's a lot of, at that point, the usual faces you would see at, like immigrants rights lawyers and people that I know and work with, stuff like that. Um, the, the, and so I'm realizing that there's gonna be three different kind of stages for the different events that I want to live stream because um, I want the world to see what's happening that Queens, that New York, that Americans are going to reject this. And so there the, the three scenes are like this multi-story parking lot. And then there's a, 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 the, the outdoor place where you, you know, where you catch a cab after you get a, off a flight. And then the inside of the airport where lawyers were helping families. Like in one case, one of my friends was helping an Iranian elder uh, who was locked in a room there, separated mm. from her family and being told she's gonna be deported for so many hours. And they separated her from even her medicine, her diabetes medicine mm. for like eight hours. She was in this room isolated and there was like real serious work already happening there. And, um, so I needed to find a battery to, to keep this phone charged. I bought one inside the airport for God knows how much money. And I it was freezing cold. And I had these wires going through my jacket so, so I could charge the phone while holding it. Oh. And it's not, yeah, it's kind of dumb to be like a brown man in an airport <laughs> oh, with, with wires, wires sticking out of me oh and God. constantly constantly running in and out and my passport and everything says like you know born in Uzbekistan and all of you know like you're just like oh, not cool geez. so I'm running back and forth I'm, I'm starting to film and you know you see the usual two three live viewers on it and the ticker's going up slightly and for the most part it's the same folks but then you start seeing kind of like you know like you always see like the skater and the sock hat you always see the vegan <laughs> anarchist you never like see the, yeah you never see the skater anarchist with the vegan slot hat and then <laughs> huh. you, you see the afrofuturist photographer and the bougie mom pushing a stroller with a baby in it but you never see the baby with the stroller and an afrofuturist mom in it like it was like everyone <laughs> was showing up like and that's where like as an organizer you know that when one person of certain archetype and class and 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 background show up there's going to be like 20 more of those or maybe thing, hundreds yeah. of more of those. So it was a thing. Yeah, exactly. And it was also the most New York protest I've ever seen where wow. people, they, they stopped just like I did, stopped whatever we were doing in New York and grabbed whatever we could make a sign out of. So like mm -hmm. people were standing there with pizza, like the most comically <laughs> New York things, like pizza boxes and with like keys scratching in the message on the pizza box That's like awesome. you know it, was, it yeah. was unbelievable like old you know like an old Mets ticket or you know like it was like <laughs> it was common if, if you were a writer you would get thrown out of the writer's room for like all the on the nose things that I saw yeah. that day um including like I, I bet at that point like if you just held up a rat with something written on it <laughs> you know it would have it would have been more so at some point it started to get 
really, really crazy. People started grabbing my arm and saying, I'm here because of your feed. Like I heard your feed, you kept giving us directions and coming and it just started to explode. And I'm running in and out of uh, the garage. In the garage, I'm greeted by, at this point, men with machine guns from the state police. Oh my who God. Were, who were gonna take down a sign. And I was like, what does this sign say? Like, it must be a terrible sign. And it says, we will love and protect each other. That was the sign. And they oh. were, they had their machine guns, whatever, right, automatic rifles drawn to get wow. that sign removed. It was, it was, it was wild. Holy crap. Yeah, and at that know. point, oh you can't make that up. No, you can't. Yeah. At that point, my hands are freezing. And then there was this like popular support around me because people were looking and they were like, he has 5,000 views. He has 10,000 views. He has 50,000 views. So everyone was like protecting me. And, and uh, one girl literally took off the gloves off her boyfriend and put them on my hands because my hands were like completely frozen Aww. outside of the tag. It was amazing. And her boyfriend looks at me like, you fucker. And <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I reached her after. I was like, can I return these gloves to you finally? She's like, no, we broke up. That was not, a, bad, that was not a good night. <laughs> but there was this one point where someone grabs me. and is like, Raph, you have like 300,000 viewers on right now on your phone. And also like they're piping you into to television live. Like you're on Greek TV. And I'm like, what? Wow. I'm on Greek TV? You're like, yeah, you're live on Greek TV. And I'm like, fuck, I'm on Greek TV. <laughs> and, then, and then another friend, you know, turned around. He was like, oh, you're not on Greek TV anymore. You said, did you say fuck you're on Greek TV? <laughs> Greek TV. <laughs> so there, there might be a clip somewhere out there where I am saying that. I have to find it <laughs> and then get cut off. But basically, there was this moment there that really stuck with me where I... I'm going back and forth. On this point, I'm leaving the airport back into the crowd on the walkway. And that is actually the same walkway my parents walked when I was two years old and they were highest refugees from Uzbekistan coming. And I was like, I was like returning and walking through that same pathway. And, and in that pathway, people were, I guess, cause I'm brown and even people who are supportive are kind of racist, <laughs> where they were just like, welcome to America, to me. <laughs> oh my God. been here since I was two years old. And I was so upset by that. I was just like, wow, like seriously, really? Wow. But then like later on that like processed through my head and I was like, well, what they were trying to do there is be exactly what I wanted to be to immigrants coming in. And they right. showed me, what it is and how it felt for like the Muslim actual people who were coming, uh, how we were greeting them. And it was beautiful to me. Yeah. And so that's like the thing that stuck with me there that wasn't that, that part where I was momentarily offensive, but like how it, it was exactly, it was exactly what I would want to happen yeah. when people come to this country. Yeah. And then wow. the other part was for me personally, like chasing perfection, wanting all this equipment, wanting all the things. And all I really had to do is be there with a story yeah. at the right time and right place and say it genuinely. And I could, I could be on this broken phone with broken glass. <laughs> and now there's like millions of people in my hands, like experiencing yeah. it because they wanted to be there. Right. Wow. All you need yeah, is was, a voice. Yeah. Pretty That's much. Amazing. And, yeah. and then, so, the, oh, are you, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Cause I remember this day. So like Raphael had this whole, like closet within our office at work that we called um the, the Dharma hatch. project from like lost or whatever like the hatch we called it the hatch <laughs> that had all of his equipment and we saw this like going viral we were like somebody get raf all the equipment <laughs> there was a line at, because there were so many people who rushed the airport after a certain point you couldn't get in so we were like trying to get in. All of Raph's stuff. Raph is texting us. It's like, I didn't ah, know this. this. And we're like, we're sending a canvasser. Like, wow. This canvasser. is the first I'm hearing about this. That's awesome. The best part was it landed me on CNN where they interviewed me. They brought me in and they interviewed me about that. And all they wanted to do is negate that it was a popular movement. They wanted to to somehow break the idea that this is going to happen. And at this point, the, the, the protests were happening nationally. Yeah. And now looking back and, and thinking that they were against the idea of a popular uprising is laughable, like every single day today. You know, yeah. 
Wow. It, it's, it, we're living in a dolly painting, you know? Everything, the whole freaking thing is so surreal, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And it was it was a very cold day because this was January, right? It was either January or February because it was like January. right after Trump got and like New York is cold in those times. <laughs> like, I remember. <laughs> like, how do you get Roth's equipment to Roth? And I was like, it's fucking cold. Like, I <laughs> love equipment. But <laughs> when I moved to New York, I was like, oh my god. Well, I mean, because I was born and raised in Hawaii, right? So yeah. yeah, my first. And you're walking experience, around in a cat suit. I can't, there you go, right? No, even worse, even worse, because I'm coming from Hawaii and I moved to New York in um, uh, September, which is hot, right? And I'm stubborn. Even when I went to Northwestern, I was totally stubborn because I'm like, I'm from Hawaii and this is what we wear. So I'm just like, you know, wearing these skimpy little shorts, needed tank tops in the dorm rooms and the guys are all looking at me like, and I'm like, it's a Hawaii thing, you know? So, <laughs> And that's when I saw snow for the first time. And oh my God, y'all, you can die from that stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's cold. Yeah, I mean, it's like seriously cold. I'm, oh my God. Oh, wait. Like, but in New York, I was like, oh yeah, this is my town. I've oh, arrived. Yeah, Here yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm walking out. I remember this guy I was dating. I, I met him from one thing and I was coming away from some dance audition. I don't know if it was from dancing or a chorus line or something. And I, I had on this skimpy little red leotard and these little white shorts and these cute little red sandals. And he looks at me and he goes, you look like a hooker. You can't <laughs> be working. <laughs> Oh, no. I'm like, I'm from Hawaii. It's fine. He was like, no, it's not fine. He used to he used to walk me to the taxi at night. He lived in Hell's Kitchen with a baseball bat just to make I'm sure I got in the cab. Boy, where's your, you know? <laughs> I love him. Oh no. What I I'm telling you, the the house I grew up in, we had uh well radiators. I lost my New York accent. I I, I had to when I went to college they told me that I had to sound like I came from somewhere from Ohio so uh, so I lost the accent you know I grew up in Queens what the hell you know I knew that you know this that and the other thing it's like we had a radiator and that's where we used to dry our jeans a radiator a radiator <laughs> it's radiator. Heard of a radiator a radiator is what you called it it was a radiator that's what how you got the heat the steam would come up and you know and if you if you lean against it, you burn the shit out of yourself. But yeah, we, just open the door. We, yeah. used, we used to dry our jeans on the radiator. And if you had to go to school really quick, you take the jeans off the radiator, you pull them on, and man, those zippers burn the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> the zippers and the rivets? Oh my God. Ow. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, when I had my son, they just cut right along that scar from the radiator. <laughs> yeah, the genital injuries in the last happy hour. <laughs> yeah, I like, oh, this is great. We'll just cut along the dotted line. Yeah, what the hell is this? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> this is why I don't, well, and these days I can't anymore, but I tried and yeah. No going commando. I, it's it's too good. <laughs> oh, I was wondering where that was going. I was like, no C section yeah, for you, dude. I'm yeah. like, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just a big anti. Anyway. anyway. <laughs> Our transition again, it's fine. Um, <laughs> Very smooth. Very smooth. Everybody's stories have been somewhat travel related, but now we're going to change. He's like, like, as soon as we called it out, then it stopped happening from the back. That's uh, true. But our, Next storyteller is uh, Lisa, who's telling a story about holiday shopping. Okay, so uh, I actually grew up in Camden, New Jersey, which at the time was uh, one of the most dangerous cities in America. Yep. And uh, in the John Wanamaker in Philadelphia, they used to have a Santa's village for the kids. Mm -hmm. So when my dad had some money, he would usually give me like, you know, 20 bucks or 25 bucks and um, you, they would give you credits, right? So you give them 20 bucks, they give you credits and then you get to go and buy junk basically, right? At, at a <laughs> discount. Um, and only little kids were allowed in the Santa's village. Uh, so, you know, I mean like they even had it where the doorway was low so that parents couldn't actually get into Santa's village. <laughs> 
So this one year I was like, you know, hey, I wonder if I'm going to get to go to Santa's village, right? Because again, it was only if we had, you know, some, some cash that we would do it. So days pass, days pass, nothing. And I'm, I noticed that my father is kind of walking around sort of slightly slumped, you know, like you do when you're a little bit bummed. And uh, the night before Christmas, so on Christmas Eve, we finished setting up our, we had a fake tree. And uh, so we finished setting up the fake tree and, you know, putting everything on it and all that. And I thought, you know, I think something's up because he's been really kind of like quiet lately. So the next morning I get up and I go to the tree and there's one package under the tree. And uh, my dad goes, so my father was a diehard caffeine addict, right? So before anything happened, he had to go and he had to get his percolated, remember the percolated uh, coffee makers? Yep. So he had to get his percolated coffee. So he goes, he gets his percolated coffee, comes back. Uh, he's in his, his robe and his jammies. And uh, he says, okay, here's this, this is for you. And I go and I open it. And years prior, he had uh, an aunt who had passed away and left me a, an antique doll. Aww. And he had... Uh, probably not a great idea actually giving it to me. She said, don't give this to your daughter until she's like 14 because it was actually worth a lot of money. It was by a famous artist. He though did give it to me earlier, which meant I of course painted its fingernails with uh, paint <laughs> as well as its toenails because that's what you do when you're a kid. So I opened the package. It's a, you know, it's all that he had given me before. You know, it's again, one of those amazing, um, uh, porcelain dolls that's you know real human hair you know the whole nine yards and he says I'm so sorry um, you know I couldn't get you anything this year but I wanted to make sure you had something under the tree and it was actually I just turned to him and I said dad this is this is the most amazing present you could have ever given me because you uh, just the fact that you even thought to put something in the tree that, that it meant this much to you means even, you know, a hundred times more. So that was my, or my, that was actually my favorite uh, Christmas ever. Uh, and then we went off and had our, you know, um, I think that year we probably did uh, Bisquick pancakes. Remember those? <laughs> I love Bisquick pancakes. Bisquick pancakes. So and um, it was probably just this quick pan pancakes and uh, politically incorrect Aunt Jemima uh, dressing <laughs> or, you know, syrup, which thank God. It was a different time. It was, it a, was different a totally time. different time. Yep. And, and he's probably tried to make me eat the powdered eggs. Remember? So, because we, yeah, yeah, yeah. during that time. So when, when I was a kid, if, if you ha didn't have any money, the government gave you government rations, basically. Yep. And so it was usually powdered eggs, powdered milk, and uh, mm. cheese. And the powdered <laughs> eggs were worth nothing unless you're going to bake with it. And the powdered milk was worth nothing unless you were going to bake with it. But the cheese, if you wanted the best grilled cheese of your life, yes. <laughs> yes. you this had to get, oh, and butter. And you got this big hunk of butter. Yes. And so we probably had eaten through the cheese. The cheese isn't worth anything other than for a grilled cheese, by the way. Uh, or yeah, the anyway. top of the macaroni and cheese, just the top. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> if you use it to melt in the macaroni and cheese, it was just a blob of goo and it yes. didn't taste like anything. Yes. But you could make the world's best grilled cheese with government macaroni, ma uh, government, government cheese. cheese. Right. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm, if I remember correctly, it was a Bisquick pancake Christmas, um, and I, I'm pretty sure I refused to drink the government powdered milk drink. So, yeah. Yep. yeah. How, old was, that, how, how old were you? How old were you? I I want to say I was 11. You were a really amazing kid. Yeah, I mean, even chocolate in that powdered shit. No. Oh, it didn't do anything. No, <laughs> chocolate did not do anything in that. No, no, no. no, no. Also, I was 11 or 12, something like that. Gross. Yeah, what? yeah. So, so that's my story. That's a great All right, now we have story. to have Ruben. Ruben has to do a story. <laughs> <laughs> the grilled cheese on some government treat cheese. 
yes. <laughs> right? I'm like, I was like, yeah. like, I don't even eat cheese anymore, but that was like, that was the treat. And believe it or not, everybody knew government cheese was the bomb for grilled cheese. So that meant that yeah. when you went to get your government rations, it was gone. Yeah. You could get plenty of powdered milk. <laughs> Plus, it's easy you because you could wheel it home. I used to always get like the boxes of clothes that were from cousins I never met. You know, it's like my mom would say, you know, I, I have all these, all the school pictures. That's awesome. Um, in these clothes. Like when I was little, I, in these clothes from, oh, that's from the cousin's box. You know, it's from the cousins. It's like, what cousins? I have no, <laughs> my mom would go to um, yard sales. And back in the day at yard sales, what they do is to sell to, they would just put back their clothes in literal trash bags and right. sell them by the trash bag. So she right. would go I and then like, look in it and be like, yeah, that might fit her and then buy that, so that would be like, these are my clothes for the next however long, right? Yeah. And it half the time it was like grandma clothes. Like, I'm like, I can't go to school in this, like grandma's old, you know, like house coat. I'm like, you know, eight <laughs> years old. You are not sending an eight year old into school in a yeah. grandma's old yeah. house coat, right? Well, well unless you're my mom, then of course. <laughs> While living in New York, I used to go to Goodwill to get suits because there was like always these suits that were perfectly fit for my body at that moment in time that were always dirt cheap. And there were so many of them and it took so many times of needing to wear a suit and going and they were always there that I realized that some man who had my same body shape had died and... <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> so I've just been slowly buying his whole wardrobe. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! So, now fast forward. I go to high school. I went to a private high school in the '80s, and all these kids I went to school with that—that that was the thing was to go to Goodwill or yeah. to go to like the secondhand store to go get your clothes. And when I first heard this i was shocked because i thought why would you do why would you do that right because i grew up where i mean that's that's it wasn't like a choice right this is just like hey look i got this for five bucks but it's someone's whole closet right here you, you are go a trendsetter, Lisa. <laughs> you were a trendsetter <laughs> i swore i i mean now if i can get it if i get a t-shirt for five bucks i'm like yeah so <laughs> Just maybe buy someone's closet for five dollars. Seen one or two articles. If I fit them, I might take. <laughs> You're like, I'm down. I'm totally. Whatever else, like, we will work it out. <laughs> You're like, I'll just keep going back there and keep on buying the bags because then I'll have plenty of wardrobe for years, right? <laughs> Oh. Okay, I'm not going to go down that bad road. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to tell my story. Um, harsh transition again. This is first car. First car. This actually relates a lot. This is actually a story about the entertainment industry. Because this is the story about how I was able to buy my first car. Nice. Um, I had always wanted to write for TV. And uh, when I was a teenager, there was um, a a contest online called Pilot Palooza. And at the time I didn't have enough money because I was like 14 or 15 and I just like did not have money because I didn't have a job. Um, and it was like 50 bucks to enter this contest. And I was like, crap, I couldn't do it. Um, but I followed a it money. a lot online, pre-social media. And this show concept ended up winning and it ended up becoming a show on CBS that Lou Diamond Phillips was in and got canceled in two episodes. But oh, I was like, this, you know yeah. this contest is legit. So the next year that they do Pilot Palooza, I have been saving. And so I <laughs> submit a concept, a pilot, a pilot treatment. I'm actually, I'm 16 at this time, or maybe I'm 15 about to turn 16. And I submit this and I don't win. I get honorable mention. Ooh, nice. Yeah. 
That's and amazing. Like, you can do. So prom, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like two show ideas got honorable mention, and I get a lot of feedback. And the feedback is interesting. They're like, "This is a really dark concept." Like, and it's pretty violent. Like, let's do it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> like, and I will tell you later what the show was. But so anyway. Whoop. Uh-oh. Um, we lost him. Oh, <laughs> oh he's okay. back. <laughs> Am I back? Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, they told me it was really dark. It was really violent. And I was really sad that I got honorable mention because that means I didn't win. And I was like, oh no. Um, but what happened is, um, and this is around 1998, 1999, um, the development director of the IFC, the Independent Film Channel, reached out to me and was like, I really believe in your concept. I really believe in your idea. I want to send it to more people. Wow. Sure, because like, I'm a 16 year old kid in Iowa, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and so she, starts, she starts asking me stuff and she's also start asking, she's like, so I have a meeting for you with Fox. Like it's at this time. And I'm like, oh, so there's a problem because that's like third period algebra. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm a teenager. <laughs> um, <laughs> background <laughs> i don't think this peabody's gonna let me out for this meeting <laughs> her first thing i'm gonna have to get a hall pass <laughs> her first thing was like don't tell anyone how old you are ever again right? like, yeah. she, we're just gonna pretend that that never happened <laughs> we're gonna get so I, I i i pitched to fox and i pitched to usa first um wow. And Fox said that the idea wasn't sexy enough. Uh, so oh, I added, of course they did. <laughs> of course they did. They were like, we don't care about the violence. Um, <laughs> it's just not sexy. And I was like, You're oh. like, I'm 15. Like, Give me what? a couple years. <laughs> you know, Fox is, if it bleeds, it leads. So, you know. And USA was like, they were like, this could be interesting, it could not be interesting, it could flop, whatever. Why don't you just produce it and we'll just air it? And then I was like, oh, well, there's the problem because I'm 16, I live in Iowa, and I cannot produce a television show. <laughs> <laughs> I have neither the know how nor the resources. This is why I'm going to. And I have homework. <laughs> Because I'm eating government cheese sandwiches here. And this Peabody won't let me out of class. So the, the biggest uphill battle, which is crazy when we think about the history of television now, the biggest uphill battle, because I ended up pitching for USA, for TNT, for TBS, and FX. And they were all like, at the time, they were like, we don't do original programming. We don't do original programming. And okay. now do is a That's all it is. Yeah. But they were really, because they were like, we have to incur the production costs. And right. I was like, I don't know anything about Hollywood. So, I, you know, because I was 16, I don't fucking care. Um, <laughs> also, so I, I, Again, homework. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know how this loops it. Like, my mom was not very supportive of me being a creative writer early on. So there was not only pitching to like major ca cable channels, but trying to hide it from my mom. And oh. uh, thankfully I worked in the guidance office in high school. So the guidance office secretary would pretend to be my secretary. So <laughs> when like- I love it. This is amazing. This is a show. And, wow. Oh my God. Like, you be producer. <laughs> <laughs> And she was like, yeah, they were like, call. And she's like, one second, he'll be right here. And then they would call me out of class. So then I would like show up in this like conference room and I would do- Oh my God. Show. Was it at the Marriott? No. <laughs> <laughs> Davenport North High School. I, I can't take this call. I'm, I'm with my private gym teacher. <laughs> <laughs> because a couple of places were gonna fly me out to LA, uh, but then they would find out that I was 16. So we were always like, no, I'll just do a pitch over the phone. Yeah. Uh, also, I was one of those kids who hit puberty early, so my voice dropped really early. So and I you had the like, facial hair, and yeah. Yeah, yeah I could like <laughs> talk on the phone for the most part. Um, and I just would not answer any questions about myself. 
Um, <clears throat> so we go through, and then there was a, a production company that decided that they wanted to option my idea. And they wow. had sent some paperwork and all this other stuff, but the lady from IFC called me and was like, you can't trust these people. They are trying to get access to certain Hollywood parties and certain Hollywood industry movers and shakers. And this is what they do. They option something that seems hot so that they can get into things. And she was like, but they never produce anything. So you don't want to do it. And this is where the story gets crazy. So <laughs> this, this time, story gets crazy. <laughs> <laughs> at this time, yeah, the the night, Roseanne Barr wants to make her own internet television station. And so she's now interested in lots of ideas of original television programming. So I pitched my idea to Roseanne. Mm-hmm. <laughs> over the phone uh, <laughs> and okay. she optioned it for three <laughs> for 10 years she had the rights to the show <laughs> and that is how I bought my first <laughs> yes. yes love it yes. Uh... I love it yes. well done did you say so for 3000 or 30000 Three thousand. So sixteen, and that was a lot. That was a lot of money, right? Oh my gosh! This you know, whole uh, story you of yours is astounding. I mean, yeah. my mind is blown that you could have pitched to so many places. I'm yeah. married to a film and television producer, and I gotta tell you, that stuff does not happen. Yeah, I mean, that's astounding. Amazing. It was all that lady from IFC. She was like, I really believe in this idea. So let me tell you the idea for my TV show. Uh-oh. All right. Keep in mind the 16. So <laughs> <laughs> it's about a group of three men who get accepted into this prestigious art school in Baltimore. And they're like super excited. They're going to college. And like one of them is a painter. One of them is an actor. One of them is a filmmaker. And they all like got assigned together at the dorms. But when they show up for the first day of classes, something happened weirdly to all their financial aid. They have no financial aid anymore. And so it's like your dream school. And now you're, you don't have any money whatsoever. So one of these three guys had a family connection that was kind of shady and they were desperate. And so they reached out to the shady family person and they were like, if you could off someone for us, we'll, we'll pay for your semester. Um, and so they decided to do it. And then what they end up deciding to do because, well, their first murder, they fuck up. They're so the terrible. <laughs> Well, you know, it's like the first pancake, you know, it never yeah, works right. out. Right. It never works out right. Like, it was in the treatment that like, they're not even good at killing someone instantly. Like, it's just really bad. But because they're artists, they internalize all of this. And then when they have money and actually start going to school, they're really good at their art. They're, like, really good at channeling these emotions because they have so much, like, guilt and unresolved feelings Thanks. for murdering you. Um, so they decided to keep it going and they <laughs> to fund their art education and the, the final season, murder. <laughs> yeah. and the final season was going to be them like lamenting that they're done with school so they no longer need to kill people but at that point they've gotten so used to it so they do in their final semester the marathon which is that they just try to kill as many people as they can. Um, <laughs> see who did, <laughs> I guess. Um, and so that was in my like pilot idea. This is why people were like, this is really dark. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I don't know, now, now so much. It can be pretty comedic. I yeah, mean, I see it I as, can as, see that as like a Dexter. Topic. Yeah. Very Breaking Bad-ish kind of yeah. thing. You know, you really. should try and sell it now. Dexter. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the rights have reverted back to me now. I can't even find these original documents anymore. Um, but yeah, and like, 
Fox, after explaining all of this stuff, and I was like, the final season, they're basically serial killers. And like, we're trying to explore this question of like, how much of what you do for money defines who you are. And for these mm-hmm. people, it's murder. And they're right. like, we're fine with that. There's just not enough. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, it's just not sexy enough. Can one of them be a girl? Like, you know. <laughs> They, they were like, can you introduce a girl? And so then I introduced a girl and I was like, bikini model, you know. the whole draft. and I was like, she's a heroin addict. And like all this. <laughs> They're like, no, that's not sexy enough. Yeah, yeah, they were like, that's not sexy enough. And then the IFC lady is like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Where are your ideas coming from? And I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I just say real quick that in college, I was the um, editor-in-chief of our school literary magazine, and half the magazine was Ruben's stories. <laughs> and I, people would be like, Anna, you're playing favorites with Ruben. And I'm like, maybe if people told better stories and were better writers, they exactly. get the magazine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I got in so much trouble I'm for playing favorites with Ruben. And I'm like, I'm sorry, he's the best writer. They're the best writer here. Like, That's what hilarious. do you want me to do? Yeah. That's in our, in our office, it was strange because all of the water cooler talk, even if Ruben, uh, even if Tiki wasn't there, uh, was stories that Tiki shared. <laughs> so it was like everyone just resharing Tiki's story. That's awesome. <laughs> We could have a whole happy hour where we all just, you know, like when you're on the 12th episode, invite yeah, people yeah. on who have all heard Teehee's stories and we can just <laughs> claim it for our own and retell it. Yeah. I, I want to hear more. I mean, you know what? I should have, you know, my, my son, my son is, um, I mean, he's, my son has Asperger's as, as I do. And um, he he has overcome a great deal, but he's so into you know the whole comic comic con thing. But he's an incredible writer, and he also he has his voice. His father is a sportscaster, so he just got his first paying gig doing a, a voice of a recurring character in this um, online series. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and he's so freaking handsome. You know, of course he's my kid. He looks nothing like me. You know, yeah, okay. so he's got, you know, dark hair, dark, you know, beard, uh, you know, and the whole night. And what you were just saying reminded me so much of him because, he, you know, I'd be reading one of his stories and I'd look at, I'd read it and I'd look at him. I go, are you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then his, father, his father would email me and say, did you read Brendan's story? I'm like, yeah, he's cool. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, send more money. You know, it's like, you know, I like, God, just send him some more money. <laughs> so awesome. I have no idea where that idea came to me, but I was like, I think it could work. And like, <laughs> those, are the best, those are the best, those are the best ideas. That you, yeah. You don't know yeah. where they came from. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And I well, feel like a dumbass well, is the person who didn't believe after Roseanne bought it and then didn't do anything with it. And I just like mm-hmm. walked away with it, with the car. Um, yeah, and the car, and a brand and the car. car. <laughs> That's awesome. But I've never pitched another show since. I haven't pitched the show since I was 16. Well, that'll change. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> That's cool. So with that, I think I want to thank everybody. Those were amazing, amazing, amazing stories. You are all just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and for those of you who are watching, thank you for watching. We hope you join us again next month. This is going to be every month, hosted by Running Wild Press. If you want to know more about our amazing stories, just go to runningwildpress.com. Uh, we actually have published uh, Carol, Tori, and obviously Tihi. So um, we love you all. Thank you again. And we hope to see you again next month. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thank you you so much. (laughs) Awesome. Okay. (gasps) (laughs) I need to pee so bad. I'm going to. I still see the record button. (laughs)